you for the invitation to be here. And uh, I'm uh, just saying some few words about mesh media attraction, open map dome, board or straw. I think it's more a boat than a straw. I'm just presenting the vertical directed uh, traction. Uh, I have no disclosures. And it started all with temporary abdominal closure for plant pre-laparotomy, the so-called uh, uh, tap in lavage in trauma. And thank you. And uh, so uh, Dietmar uh, Wittmann and uh, Professor Teichert from Hamburg are to be named in this uh, context. Then we had the temporary intraven uh, intravenous back seal or closure in severe abdominal trauma. It was the next step. And then the first one. Uh, with the mesh-mediated facial traction was by Ulf Pettersson from Sweden with the vacuum-assisted wound closure and the mesh-mediated facial traction. It was a horizontal traction. And then it, uh, it is of high importance to uh, have the negative pressure uh, treatment in that wound uh, treatment as well. And we have two uh, different uh, uh, versions of that and uh, of highest importance is to put in the plastic uh, far to the sides into the abdomen to get that correct. Here, a horizontal traction or vertical traction, old or new, new ways, this is to be discussed. Uh, application of horizontal direct attraction Im is impeded very often by prolapsing organs. And by that, a facial traction retraction has to be accepted. And so you have to accept a delayed facial closure and increasing complications, in fact, of long open treatment. We all know about that. And with a vertical traction, with the facial tent system, you can see an immediate application with laparostoma is possible, and by that an early closure and less uh, revisions in the OR. Vertical directed uh, traction can prevent the loss of domain because it is increasing the volume of the abdominal cavity over the treatment. And it is a reduction of the intra-abdominal uh, pressure to be gained. And here you can see the same for the horizontal traction. You see there are some revisions necessary and you do have to open and restore it completely in two or three revisions in OR. And then after that longer time with the implication of possible uh, problems and complications, the abdominal wall closure can be done. In vertical traction, it's easier and quicker. And here you can see uh, uh, the studies uh, with scientific situation of vertical directed traction. I only go in uh, to the Fong uh, one. Uh, there he could show that the vertical traction device prevents abdominal wall retraction and facilities earlier primary facial closure and of septic and non-septic open abdomen. Here you can see a case of a 16-year-old patient with reperfusion edema after coarctatio or auto repair. The problem is the edema. And if you do the vertical traction, you have the place uh, for the edema to go away uh, without any higher pressure. And here you can see how it worked. That first of all was uh, done the wound closure, uh, left a uh, right side uh, downwards on the abdominal wall. And then after more traction, uh, step by step, it could be closed completely. Here another case of uh, acute necrotizing pancreatitis, seven days, uh, sev seven days uh, of open abdomen, and they had 26 centimeters of distance, and then they started with the uh, vertical traction with the fascia tent systems, and after uh, a few uh, days, it was possible to close it completely because of the reduced, reduced edema, and uh, together always with the negative pressure uh, treatment and this works very well in combination. Here in another case, you see uh, the, uh, the pictures are uh, talking for themselves, and you can see that uh, a wake uh, uh, a patient is uh, helping with his own hand to redo uh, uh, the uh, uh, traction force here in the. Uh, in his own bed. And you can see how it works, that uh, it is to be closed after a few days only. Yes, and now I come to the take-home message, because we want to save some time. <laughs> Vertical traction offers some advantages over horizontal traction. Facial traction is possible nearly from the first moment. Continuous stretching of the lateral abdominal wall with relatively easy to perform VAC therapy in combination, this is necessary. Avoidance of more frequent revisions in the OR. 
enlargement of the abdominal cavity via the uh, treatment, possibly faster final closure of the abdomen. That's it. Thank you for your attention. And Hamburg is not the LVA only. Thank you for your attention. Good morning, colleagues. What a privilege it is to be back in India and uh, to be talking about surgery. It's a fantastic meeting, and I'm really privileged to be here. Um, I come from uh, what could be called the trauma capital of the world. Uh, it's a very beautiful city, but it's uh, not without its problems. Um, so I don't have any relevant disclosures uh, to this talk. So I think I'm uh, already talking to people who know a lot about the open abdomen. Obviously, this is not a normal anatomical situation, um, and it carries quite a lot of risks. We know about these risks. We know about these complications but they're pretty significant. We've got the problem of fistulas, we've got the problem of uh, frozen abdomen, lots of problems with sepsis, intra-abdominal abscesses. But of course, we're interested in the fascial closure as hernia surgeons, and this is a real problem for us. And it's a problem because uh, it's not good for the patient, not because it doesn't give us interesting work. So the whole idea really started in trauma, and if you look and go back at the guidelines, you know, we all love guidelines, so we can go back to the guidelines and we can take a look at when is the open abdomen uh, indicated in a trauma setting. So that seems pretty obvious. We've got the situation of the lethal triad, and we know that acidosis and hypothermia together with coagulopathy lead to a scenario where the patient is in such a poor physiological condition that no matter how wonderful a surgery you do, you cannot rescue this patient. And so you might need to do something abbreviated or shortened uh, to allow for an ongoing resuscitation of the patient while you just control the immediate situation. So of course it makes sense that you maybe don't want to go through the, the rigmarole of having to close the abdomen thereafter. But uh, I think it's important to really emphasize that this idea of open abdomen really came from the problem of intra-abdominal hypertension. And it's quite difficult because I think we've become separated from this idea that the real only data that we have that uh, tells us that we can reduce mortality is in the situation of raised intra-abdominal pressure. So um, if you want to know when you're likely to run into this situation, we, we have this data, and we know what the risk factors are and when we are going to have problems with raised intra-abdominal pressure. So the, the, the idea kind of evolved, and we started talking about uh, damage control and open abdomen in non-trauma patients, and it's now used in a wide variety of scenarios. Patients with severe peritonitis who might need an abbreviated laparotomy, clip and drop is a commonly used term. We have these disastrous vascular emergencies with lots of ischemia, ruptured aneurysms, and so on. And uh, then probably the most well-known by all of us would be the severe pancreatitis patients who have necrotizing pancreatitis requiring multiple relooks. And then, interestingly, you know, because it's quite, uh, it's quite interesting to see what everybody was talking about during COVID, we even ran into the scenario where we started to, to discover that patients with severe COVID were having problems with uh, raised intra-abdominal pressure. And decompressive laparotomies were actually done for patients in the early phases of COVID uh, because of this complication. So at the end of the day, you've got three different sets of people. Um, you've got surgeons who really think that uh, leaving the abdomen open is a fantastic tool. You can really use it for a lot of uh, scenarios. And then you've got surgeons who think that you know, it's probably not that problematic, but uh, you, you should only really do it when necessary. And then you've got surgeons that believe that it's really costly with minimal supporting data. So we have the guidelines. I told you about the guidelines. There's the guidelines from the World Society um, of Emergency Surgery, but they were published in 2018. Let's have a look at some data that's come out subsequent to that. 
So this is just uh, one of the one of the papers out there, uh, just having a look at the difference between damage control uh, surgery and definitive closure, or open abdomen definitive closure. Um, so, so it's important to separate those two things because damage control doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to leave the abdomen open, but approximately one third of patients who get damage control surgery will uh, end up with an open abdomen. So does it really work? Does damage control really work? So um, if you close your patient definitively, you've got a 72% chance of more ventilator and hospital free days and a 77% chance of more ICU free days. So that doesn't sound that great for temporizing your patient. Uh, so if we look at uh, patients in, in damage control that could have been closed, um, you've got, uh, you're looking at a 56% probability of major abdominal complications. So uh, let's compare the, the two groups, damage control and definitive closure groups, um, and, and have a look at those, those major complications. And if you look uh, into this data, you'll see that the relative risk is 0.99, which basically means they're the same. Um, and then, you know, we've, we've already... Um, mentioned about the hospital free days and the ICU free days and the ventilator free days. So we're really not looking at a very uh, compelling idea here. Uh, so uh, what about uh, if we, we do actually leave, uh, leave these patients uh, open? So first of all, more than one third of the patients that are left with an open abdomen are going to require multiple relook laparotomies. Um, and that drives up complications and it drives up mortality and it drives up costs. So if we have a look at that and we think about leaving the abdomen open, our original idea was that we were gonna save lives, we were going to uh, be able to get the patient in a better physiological condition, but the point is that this does not actually translate uh, when you look at it in the real world. So I wanted to put this slide here, not because I want you to, to look at this complicated algorithm. This algorithm uh, also comes from the World Society of, of Emergency Surgery. But I wanted to put this slide here because I wanted to go back to the beginning to remind us that what we're talking about here is that we only really have one true indication to do decompressive laparotomy, and that is in the situation of raised intra-abdominal pressure. And if you have this scenario, obviously it's important to recognize, but uh, the point that I wanted to make is that we have a number of medical measures that we can use um, which, with which you should be familiar together with your intensive care physician so that you can um, maybe consider uh, utilizing some of these options uh, before you move um, to the, the dire situation of doing a decompressive laparotomy. But I don't want to leave you with the message that you shouldn't do it, because if you do really truly have uh, raised intra-abdominal pressure, then you really need to do an emergency decompressive laparotomy. And you shouldn't delay, no matter what the, what the complications are. So um, in the interest of the wonderful talks that are to come, I'm going to uh, skip past that. And I'm just going to say, um, I hope that uh, it will no longer be your knee-jerk response to leave the abdomen open. Um, and that you recognize that it has significant um, complications, but also that it doesn't uh, necessarily buy us uh, the mortality benefit that we thought that it did. And uh, perhaps we should be looking uh, to keeping the abdomen closed more often. Thank you very much. So uh, today I will discuss about cases which I discussed yesterday at SSTM as well. And I felt like these are the cases which I should show to everyone. Uh, so I'll show those cases again. And comments are welcome. Can you start, please? Yeah, thank you. So um, I'll start directly. This is a lady operated sleeve gastrectomy. And after that, there was leak then laparotomy and then refer to us. So this was the condition of the wound. As you can see, the pus is pouring out and we cleaned it nicely, applied VAC, but after that also the condition remained same. The VAC was pouring out in liters, 
for like five wag dressings that is like around 10 days there was on ct scan no leak we did stenting there was no foci of any uh, infection there was no foreign body inside but it was coming out and we kept on doing just cleaning 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 the pockets and ultimately it started showing response see this is the kind of uh, pus which is coming out from the wound but uh, finally it started showing the response and now you can see we can see the liver and visceral uh, uh, other viscera finally after five wag dressings and we continued same clean debrided ultimately after 45 days this was the condition and then we did secondary suturing and she was fine so this is with consent of the patient this is the patient finally good condition so the idea is this kind of patient they do really well if you are committed and you are doing the best you can now this is the patient with uh, posterior component separation and tar and we all know sometimes when there is tension there is cut through there is a rent in the peritoneum and when you try to close the peritoneum the rent further increases so this increase in rent increases if you are trying to repair it that is a major problem and it spoils everything so here as you can see can i have the pointer please this i am pointing at this my forceps is pointing at dressing it is human amnion chorion growth factor dressing it is available in india it is very cheap i just fixed it here you can leave it inside the body it's absolutely safe this thing and after 7 days it is dissolved it has a good healing property with growth factors and that's all after that over that i kept a surgery cell snow and over that i placed mesh nothing extra was required otherwise these kind of cases create lot of tension so next this is a patient with polytrauma 28 year old female and the 16 tire truck she was hit by 16 tire truck and the driver left truck over her front tire and ran away fortunately uh, she was young she was chubby somebody else came and he took the uh, truck out from over from her body so these are the tire marks you can see of the truck and on the opposite side because of the pressure you can see this everything has burst open so this is uh, actually without fracture without any uh, injury internal injury to the viscera peritoneum was intact somehow she was lucky only thing was bleeding she was having internal bleeding we cleaned debrided immediately took in the ot and closed the bleeders she did well now you can you tell me what is this so uh, this is my hand and this is complete connection from thigh to tummy initially when we started this is the amount of discharge with infection and pus coming and once the wag stopped working in the night for 6 hours then we restarted the wag and you can see how it is coming it's flowing like in liters 1.5 liter came out immediately so this is all protein loss this is all protein loss and if it is there inside without a wag dressing then you can imagine how horrible the condition could have been so that's why negative pressure is a very good dressing and you should never hesitate using it this is my personal uh, experience and because of this only probably the patient was saved but this is also very heavy protein loss so very good nutrition very very good uh, care of proper nutrition should be taken while treating these kind of patient otherwise they may not do well so this is the patient she was admitted this i will this i always tell everybody she was admitted on the day of anniversary she was going to buy bouquet and cakes and she was discharged at her birthday they came to me after 3 years not for follow up but to uh, share with us their good news this this baby so in spite of all those injuries and everything is spoiled if you do well patient by miracle by god's grace they do well you don't know how and why but they do well now this is one patient with large incisional hernia did pcs with tar 30 by 30 proline mesh was applied he was diabetic hypertensive and after removal of stitches after 15 days he reported to casualty with 
open wound, serious discharge, and the history of like approximately 300 lit, uh, ml of fluid out from the tummy. So this is the pre-op picture. This is, I'm um, sorry, it is not in proper orientation. This is hernia, as you can see, big, large incisional hernia. And this is how, this is the condition when he was there in emergency. You can see sutures of the anterior sheath, mesh, slough. And this is going completely inside. This is large artery forcep. And this is exposed mesh, completely exposed. We kept on doing, I cleaned everything, applied VAC. I explained to the patient and attendant there are two conditions. One, we can take this out and then we do surgery again in future. So there are problems involved with that. Taking out is a problem and again doing surgery for that kind of hernia with mesh explant also is a problem and can lead to complications. Other option is we can go ahead with mesh salvage. We can try our label best. I explained about wag dressings and other things and I told him clearly. Maybe after one month again I will say that this is not working and I will take the mesh out. Patient agreed with uh, one month mesh salvage uh, treatment option and we proceeded. I, all culture, antibiotic accordingly manage good nutrition and wag dressings. So finally, after good amount of wag dressings, this was the condition. As you can see, it is healthy now, very healthy. And this is all closed. This space was obliterated and only this was exposed. This is the exposed mesh. Here, I, I applied elastin collagen dressing, which are available in market under various names. And that is very good dressing. It can it uh, it has many uh, healing properties with growth factors, and it uh, stops the growth of myofibers so that the wound contraction is not happening because of myofibers. So it stops that process, el elongates it elongates the growth fibers. So it is very good dressing. I applied this dressing, and over that I applied a wag dressing. So you see, after three days, over the mesh there is granulation tissue. But it is not very healthy. It is pale. Again, one more dressing I applied and did one more wet dressing over that. And it started showing response. And this is the condition after three more wet dressings, completely healed for five days. Now it is contracted, healed. And this is the final condition. So not even one centimeter of mesh was excised. I will. I want to be a little bit quick because limited time. This is a polytrauma with uh, mucormycosis. Young male admitted when we debrided, it was like uh, biopsy showed mucormycosis. This is posterior rectus sheath, but because of mucormycosis, had to excise everything off, including peritoneum. So it was like a open box with uh, viscera inside. There's no cover, not even peritoneum. Plastic surgery referred us, so this is what they were using. I removed this. Then cleaned everything. There was a patch of mucor over here. Cannot excise completely because here is colon. So if anything happens to colon, I cannot even exteriorize. So I applied this dressing. It is a blue hydrofera which contains gentian violet, methylene blue and antifungal properties. Excellent dressing. You can apply it directly over vac, over nerve, over tendon, over bone, wherever you want. It is, slip it is slippery. So when you take it off, it is painless. It has, it works with negative pressure suction as well. So it has the property, very good dressing. Over that, I applied normal back. It started working. This is that mucor patch. This is granulation tissue over the omentum. You can see growing granulation tissue over the omentum. And this is the patch, which is now not spreading further. And I removed it later on. After removing, this was the condition. Then finally, when it was healthy, absolutely fine. This uh, mobilized the skin and tucked in the mesh, 30 by 30 centimeter mesh tucked in inside and applied back. Now you can see there is granulation tissue coming over the uh, mesh after one back dressing and now the mesh is completely covered with granulation tissue. So Abhishek, this patient is Abhishek, also... You need to stop. Your time yeah, yeah. is over. I'm done. This is my last... Thank uh, you so much. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, again, I'd like to uh, reiterate uh, Heather's uh, 
compliments to the organising committee. It's a privilege to be here. All right. Um, I'm a surgeon from Melbourne. Uh, I don't have any real disclosures from this particular talk. So fortunately, a lot of what I'm going to say has already been covered a bit this morning. So repetition, as I say, is good. And I could be able to fly through a couple of slides. So the open abdomen is a therapeutic technique. And it's employed when we can't close the abdomen or we shouldn't close the abdomen. And Dr Bogart's uh, kindly shown earlier the sort of clinical situations that it needs to be employed in. So we're talking about abdominal catastrophes or established or incipient uh, compartment syndrome where there's a need for a second look laparotomy, for example, uh, or a burst abdomen. And also in the cases where patients present with loss of domain, large incisional hernias and uh, need an emergent operation, then getting that abdomen back together can be a challenge. There's a classification from the open abdomen uh, derived by uh, Bjork and colleagues, and basically it uh, classifies the abdomen on the basis of its contamination, uh, the fixity of the underlying viscera, and the presence or absence of an established uh, fistula. So what are we talking about in this context, abdominal wall reconstruction? Are we talking about just closing the fascia? Are we talking about reinforcing it with mesh? Are we talking about a complex abdominal wall reconstruction with bilateral tar, etc.? So if we're talking about the latter, uh, just don't do it. Right? So this is an upside down Nike flash. We've got plenty of options, uh, as uh, again was alluded to earlier in the day, uh, starting from wet to dry dressings through to more uh, sophisticated uh, techniques, including the modern negative pressure wound therapies, of which you can see some here, Whitman patch, uh, the Bogota bag, uh, and the uh, vac. But we don't get such great results when the abdomen's left open. We have uh, high rates of uh, fistula formation, mortality, and uh, often the uh, fascia is unable to be closed. What we do know, uh, this was the article that uh, Dr Bogart uh, referenced before, we do know that if you can close the abdomen, then uh, when you compare it to someone who's had an open abdomen uh, treated extensively on the hope of getting a uh, planned ventral hernia, they have more complications, a high mortality and a longer length of stay. And even using uh, the more sophisticated negative pressure wound therapies, uh, at best we get this sort of uh, outcome. More often it's like this. And not infrequently it's like this. So what is the long-term outcome if you have an open abdomen uh, that granulates and you get a graft on it with a planned ventral hernia? This is work that was published in 2021 from the uh, uh, group in uh, Germany. Uh, and even of the patients who had uh, primary fascial closure, more than half finished up with a hernia. But more importantly, of the 40 patients that had a planned ventral hernia, 31 uh, had an issue. They either didn't get their surgery well, those that got their surgery, uh, two-thirds got a recurrence. And so at the end of this uh, scenario, 28 of the 40 still had a hernia. So the static techniques are not all that effective. Uh, on the other hand, if you uh, use uh, primary fascial closure or getting the fascia closed together, then you have less complications. Uh, this is the experience uh, from... Uh, some US uh, army surgeons on uh, soldiers from Iraq and Afghanistan, and they got uh, less complications. So what are we talking about in terms of definitive closure? Well, we can uh, just close the skin, that's not definitive. We can uh, suture, as I said, or we can do some sort of bridge repair. There are lots of uh, options for fascial traction, both homemade and commercially available. Uh, and we've uh, seen uh, pictures like this and of course, uh, Dr. Nybor uh, spoke before about uh, uh, vertical fascial traction, and we're going to hear a lot more about that uh, in the next few days. The long-standing, uh, well-established uh, technique is mesh-mediated fascial traction. Uh, Pedersen uh, and his colleagues were the first to combine it with negative pressure wound therapies and got uh, excellent results. 
Uh, this is uh, from the uh, group in Koblenz who have used it extensively and published uh, extensively and developed what was known as the Koblenz algorithm, whereby open abdomens are treated with uh, dynamic measures and then uh, closed when uh, possible, and if not, uh, left to granulate up and uh, planned ventral hernia repaired later. We also know that if you put Botox in uh, the uh, patients with an open abdomen, they're easier to get together, especially if you start it early. We've recently published on our modifications of that. I've just talked about that in the innovation session. But in effect, we uh, wrap the edges of the uh, mesh around the fascia to provide extra strength and extra traction. Uh, and we put Botox in early. This is a recent illustrative case, a man who had a perforated uh, stomach following a fund application that went badly and was transferred to our facility. And over, uh, in this case, 11 days and four take-backs to theatre, we got him together. So these are our results from the last uh, few years of the 12 of the 13 patients that survived, all got their fascias closed, and none of them have hernias at uh, up to three years so far. So uh, this is a, an article from uh, a group in uh, Finland, again, combining negative pressure wound therapy and mesh-mediated fascial traction. Uh, and a systemic review uh, in uh, hernia from a couple of years ago uh, showed dynamic techniques work well there as well. And so the reality is, is that European Hernia Society suggests that we should strongly recommend dynamic over static uh, techniques. And fascial closures positively associated with that and negatively associated with the degree of contamination and the time to start open abdominal therapies. We know just after an ordinary laparotomy that if you augment the uh, wound with uh, mesh, uh, it reduces incisional hernia rate. Well, what about if we use it in the open abdomen? So this uh, group of uh, war veterans, again, uh, they in fact had effectively mesh-mediated fascial uh, traction, and then their wounds were uh, reinforced with mesh, and they had a low uh, incisional hernia rate in the uh, group that survived. Uh, similarly, uh, this uh, group of Finnish surgeons, really they were doing mesh-mediated or uh, mesh-augmented primary fascial closure. And we look at their results, you can see here, this is the hernia rate. Hernias were quite common in bridged repairs and clearly those that were meant to have a hernia. But if you look at those that had direct fascial closure with mesh compared to those that had direct fascial closure without mesh, the hernia rates were substantially less. So adding mesh to their group of uh, primary fascial closures reduced their hernia rate, albeit at the cost of uh, some mesh infections that uh, required explanting in three of the five cases. This is not in an open abdomen, but it's burst abdomen and it's work from uh, Dr. Lopez Cano. And the incisional hernia rate when they used mesh was half that when they didn't use mesh. Uh, that European Hernia Society uh, program from a few years ago, they found that if you add uh, mesh in the cases where they had randomised controlled trials, there was only 100 patients, uh, there was a 20% decrease in incisional hernia rate. So it seems you can add mesh uh, to uh, reinforce the wound. And in fact, that's the uh, current recommendation from the European Hernia Society, that when you get the abdomen closed, it should probably be reinforced with an onlay mesh. Does it matter what sort of mesh? This is a small study out of Germany, again, called the PROMOTE trial, where they've compared a biosynthetic mesh with a synthetic mesh. Uh, it's only five patients in each arm, but the results are comparable. What about uh, doing a component separation if you can't get the fascia closed? Well, there's some evidence, again, from another study out of uh, Finland showing that component separation, anterior component separation, is feasible. It's best done at the time of the definitive closure of the abdomen, not uh, beforehand, but it has its issues. Uh, it's another Finnish study that's also uh, produced uh, component separation. So the recommendation from the European Hernia Society is that it probably shouldn't be undertaken, uh, except in exceptional circumstances. Uh, one of the other things that may be considered is uh, the uh, anterior rectus abdominal sheath turnover flap, which is sort of a uh, modification of the chevral uh, technique uh, where it can be used in uh, both the open abdomen and get definitive closure. So in summary then you need to deal with the underlying pathology. I think you, they should have Botox as soon as possible. They should have some sort of vacuum assisted fascial traction, primary fascial closure and probably uh, mesh uh, on top of that. It seems that anterior component separation can be employed but selectively 
And there's a new version of the Koblenz algorithm that now includes uh, onlay non-absorbable mesh after you've got the abdomen closed. And send it to someone else if you don't think you can cope with it. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. It's uh, it's an uh, it's an honor to be here, and I congratulate um, the organization for this superb conference. Um, so let's go really quick here because um, um, talking about intra-atmospheric fistulas is not easy. So I'm going to go through all these uh, topics which are here, and basically, generally speaking. Um, the open abdomen, we've already spoken about that earlier, so I'm not going to bother you with that. And enteroatmospheric fistula, we know by the name. It just has to do with intestine and the atmosphere, so that's pretty easy. When we look at um, fistula output, at our uh, department, we like to look at below 200, which is a low uh, output. It's easier to control. If it's more than 500, we know we're going to have a lot of problems, and we're going to have to do what we call... Uh, intestinal rehabilitation. Basically, we have to uh, refrain as much the output of the bowel. Um, if you operate, and if you operate on bowel, then you're going to have complications. If you're not operating on bowel and you're doing just thyroid or breast, for sure you won't have intestinal fistula. So the majority of the ca causes are from surgeons. Other causes are from IBD and, and for example, radiotherapy. The consequence of, um, of intra-atmospheric fistula have to do a lot with the output. And the higher the, the fistula, the higher the output, the more acidic it is. So it's going to burn your skin, it's going to cause major wound problems and multi-resistant infections and recurrent sepsis. So the best tr treatment for this is actually to prevent fistulas. And we all know that more than eight days, there's an exponential rise of fistulas that you can see here and not only fissures, but other problems also. So Bjork's classification was amended in 2016, and what we're trying to do is basically avoid the fixated abdomen so we can have less complications. Because if you have a fixated abdomen, you're going to have a higher fistula rate. So at our department, if we have a patient that has uh, already stomas or has a fistula, we just close the skin. If we can't close the skin, we'll do a split skin graft. Remember, close as soon as possible. And that's, that's what we want to do. And, um, you know, we try to get the skin together. And I think it's pretty easy a lot of times, but sometimes it's not that easy. And then we'll do a split skin graft, and we do it as quick as possible. And we do not put Vicro on top of the, the, the abdomen, uh, because we consider, according to the literature, that there's a higher fistula rate. So, as was mentioned before, uh, the, the results um, by some standards are not considered too, uh, too great, but in, in reality, looking at the uh, systematic review, uh, we're closing anywhere from uh, in trauma uh, to 82-85%, and in, in sepsis, we're closing 75.6% around there with mesh-mediated traction. Um, to prevent fistula, when you have an open abdomen, if you have bowel, etc., what you have to do, the key is to look at this study from Theodore Borson where they measured the pressure, and what you see is actually you have lower pr pressure on the bowel if it's tucked deep and to the side, as you can see here. So of minus 125, it's actually less than minus 25 around here. So that's a trick. You can also protect uh, if you have an anastomosis in an open abdomen uh, with a omentum or even another bowel, suture another bowel to that suture. Another thing we also do at our department, we favor a lot, is a clip and drop attitude. Um, we don't like to make stomas right away, and we can wait up to 8 to 10 days to make a, a, an anastomosis. And uh, on average at our department, we do it from 5 to 7 days, uh, the anastomosis. Because that way you'll have less um, output, you'll have less problems to deal with, and it's going to be a big problem. And uh, also you'll have major destruction of the abdominal wall. So you have to be efficient with these patients. These patients have to be adopted by a surgeon. 
and, and a senior surgeon because um, things don't go well, they're catastrophic, and the patients really um, have problems, and, and so do the, the family. So they, it's hard to understand the body image, and it's very expensive. What we try to do with these patients also is have um, a, a, a structured approach despite all the chaos. And what we do is we follow the SNAP protocol. And um, basically what it is, is just recognizing and resuscitating at the same time the patient and studying anatomically where the fistula is to see what we can expect. And then according to this output and according to what is happening, we'll see what will occur and how we can close eventually the fistula. So if we see any mesh, we start to take it out. Um, if the small intestinal rehabilitation starts right away, we, we put octreotid and we start pantoprazole, for example, and glutamine, colostermin. We try to do as much as we can IV, not, nothing peros for, uh, at the start, and we see uh, how things, the output goes. And then eventually you start to slowly put in um, our um, enteric and, and, and oral formulas. So what we're doing is reintestinal rehabilitation. So we're just causing four to six times hypertrophy of the, of the mucosa of the bowel before the fistula. So that's the, the idea. Anatomy is fundamental, so you can see what you can do eventually and to understand if this type of fistulas will close. If it's a big gore, a big hole, it's not going to close. If it's a short uh, path, it's not going to close. You just have to think of a, a big tunnel, and a, a big long tunnel will collapse easier, so a fistula can close easier. So it's easy, and you have to look at it and close the abdomen as you can, at least with a split skin graft or um, with um, the, the, the skin, and then go back in six months to do reconstruction. Leave their battle for another day. And what we do is we um, split skin graft. I mean, look at this patient with an IBD disease. Uh, came fistulizing Crohn's, came from the outside, and um, you know was in bad shape. And we split skin graft the patient, and then we studied and we found out that this fistula was actually in the very high in the jejunum. So we converted it to a stoma, a feeding stoma. And uh, after 14 months, uh, we made uh, the reconstruction of this patient and took it out on block. So if the problem is when you have a fistula and it's hidden, well, what we do is usually we put in two drains and we don't stick the brains inside the bowel. We put it close to the area where we think it is according to the CT. And um, it will, one will lavage and the other will drain it out. So basically what you're doing is the, you're diluting the pollution, okay? The solution to pollution is dilution. And um, for example, in some cases such as pancreatitis, um, a lot of times you'll end up with a fistula of, of, of the, the flexures. And then what we'll do is we'll just make a pseudostoma. And that way it's another option that you can do. It's marsupialization. But when you see the stomas in the middle, you can make a floating stoma, which is easier. Thank goodness now we have, uh, besides the baby bottle nipples, we have um, appliances. And uh, such as the funnel and the fistula crown. And as you can see here, I mean, this is a uh, single stage patient that went bad and had a dehiscence. We lost the, the, the word wound contraction. So we controlled everything and we did a split skin graft. And uh, that, that's the take up after of the, of the wound. So this is it here again, just to show you. Always leave an interface. Please do not put foam directly on the, on, on the, um, on the bowel because you'll end up with a fistula. Make sure your trackpad is away from it. And then you just make your floating stoma. You're going to apply your appliance on top of the vac. Uh, at our department, this is a photo a few, a uh, few years ago from me and Eva uh, in 2009, an article that we published where the, we have the anesthetist put in high epidurals and, uh, tunneled and the patient is watching Oprah Winfrey while we're doing the, the open abdomen stuff in the ward, no anesthesia at all. Forget sutures, please, don't do that. And another thing, don't make a little hole into a big hole. We see that a lot, people are always putting tubes in. The tubes work for um, intracutaneous fistulas, not for enteroatmospheric fistulas, because you don't have no connective supportive tissue to go around that. So you're gonna make a little hole into a big hole. This is our algorithm at our hospital. We try to get everything closed in eight days. We recently started to do vertical mesh-mediated traction. 
we were doing horizontal and uh, BTA in pancreatitis. That's usually when we do it because we know that the abdomen is going to be longer closed. Once again, have it closed primarily. That's our ideal. If not, plans ventral hernia. Again, that that's our story. Um, this was widely shown of the work group, and um, I was part of this work group, and we couldn't find any good um, techniques with regards to closure, but again, it's always based on experience. So here you go again, once again, illustrating the, the split thickness, and always go back after six to 12 months, not before, and as you can see here, this is a clean contaminated, it's not called contaminated, it's clean contaminated, fistula, intestinal takedown, and then after um, two years, the patient did well, we did a, um, a single stage of approach, and once again, that's my take home message for you guys. Manage the patient as a whole, prevent fistula, recognize early if you have a fistula, control sepsis, and please decide on resection, closure, or conservative management. Thank you Thank so you. much for that. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Um, I'm, I have a declaration. Uh, we, I don't present any new procedure. I only present how we standardize open abdomen management in Trentino. So um, open abdomen is also known as damage control laparotomy or laparostomy. It's a uh, uh, characteristic, its indication are damage control surgery, septic abdomen, and abdominal compartment syndrome, as you know. Um, Definitive facial closure need to be uh, obtained as soon as possible, and delayed facial closure represents a risk for increased complication rate. Primary facial closure risk presents a late incidence of ventral incisional hernia, ranging from 21 to 54%, and in literature we have a different rate up to 73% in uh, according to which kind of tax is used to manage the open abdomen. Dilemmas. How to obtain a higher rate of primary, primary facial closure after open abdomen? And second, how to reduce complication rate related to, to, related to compound separation additional procedures? Um, our rationale is based on these three things. It is necessary to avoid additional invasive surgical procedure and chemical compound relaxation of lateral um, abdominal muscles is, uh, as demonstrated, its value. In, uh, in preparative preparation to for the reconstruction of a of complex abdominal wall. And uh, although are few, in uh, literature are present about 100 cases described in different, uh, in different papers in uh, managing Botox and abdominal in uh, open abdomen uh, management. So our opinion is that any possible procedure is available and is useful for open abdomen management. We decided, based on our experience in Botox administration in preparation to uh, complex abdominal wall repair, uh, to adopt this algorithm. Uh, after emergency laparotomy, we, prefer, we value primary fascial closure if, if primary fascial closure is achievable. And if not, we perform open abdomen and Barker's vacuum first uh, on first inter on first operation. After a patient was admitted in ICU intensive care, in uh, intensive care unit, uh, we perform a US guided CCR on that side. 48 hours later, we perform a planned relook in uh, operating room. This is just this uh, is guided by the time to uh, onset of uh, on, of Botox. So after that, after this first relook, we reassessment the abdomen for primary fascial closure. Uh, so for primary fascial closure, if it's not, we perform a, a, a tax with negative pressure wound therapy and traction sutures. From then, every 72 hours we go to the operating, operating room to perform a new reassessment of the abdomen. In, in any operation, in any, in any revision of the abdomen, we uh, try to uh, reapproximate margins at the edge of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the incision uh, by single stitches until we obtain a definitive closure. 
uh, we performed Botox injection like described by Zendaya in 2013 by ultrasound guided technique. Uh, we use about uh, uh, 25 international units of Botox per milliliter in solution and uh, we uh, administer one milliliter in each layer we, we have to infiltrate. Just a clinical case. This is, um, I, I, I will uh, describe this case because uh, he, ha he completed one year follow up after the, inter after the first operation. So he's a male, 16 year, 68 years old. His BMI at the, at, the, at, the, at the admission to the hospital was 35 kilos for, for square meters. A, comple a complex uh, pathological history is present and a lot of medicine is, as usual, medical therapy is in, uh, easy, in easy history. On 14 of February, he was hospitalized to the, he was admitted in medical department of our hospital with a diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. After 16, uh, um, after, 40, after 48 hours, a worsening of his, a worsening of his hemodynamic condition and the appearance of a moth led to a new CT scan performed. With the, um, with the bad evolution of the, of the pancreatitis in necrotic hemorrhagic pancreatitis. So emergency laparotomy was, at, was performed and uh, abdominal debridement and open, up, open abdomen with Barker's VAC was, was, was administered. After admission to ICU, chemical component relaxation was, was, uh, was uh, performed by US guided Botox injection of lateral abdominis muscles. February 18, on 48 hours after the first operation, uh, the relook and cleansing of the abdominal wall was, was performed and uh, we applied a tax uh, in using NP a negative potential wound therapy and retention sutures to, uh, to maintain in position abdominal muscles, abdominus rectus. Three days later, a new relook was, was uh, performed and we a reassessment and the reassessment of the abdomen was uh, performed. We started with the approximation of the edges of the incision by stitches and then we applied negative pressure wound therapy and retention sutures. Four, three days later, we performed the last relook of the abdomen and uh, we obtained, a f we achieved a definitive primary facial closure of the abdomen by running sutures. In March, uh, between March and April, uh, we detected a, a pancreatic fistula who was treated conservatively and anti-resolution anti and then on May, he was uh, discharged at home. Eight, month, eight, eight months later, uh, we performed a CT scan to control the situation and we and the CT scan revealed a right pleural effusion who was uh, uh, identified as a collateral finding and a small and asymptomatic periumbilical incisional hernia. The patient was then entrusted to pulmonologist for the treatment of uh, the right pleural effusion. After discharge, the patient changed his life and stopped drinking alcohol, introduced sport activities, and after one year, his BMI is 26. Was a, he, he exceeded our expectations. From so, the take home message. Acute life, life treating abdominal events pose a major challenge to the emergency surgeon. Standardized use of chemical complex relaxation can be, could be a useful tool in open abdomen management in, to implement fascial closure in the BC, delayed fascial closures. Until now, a scarce literature is present, so we need to, to we need new studies to uh, validate this approach. Thank you.